Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. I'm your co-host, Rich Gear. Um, we're talking about the pollinators today, right, Doug? Well, uh, uh, a creation? little bit more uh, generically, we're talking about symbiosis. Symbiosis, uh, okay. and And that is the uh, case where you have two vastly different uh, types of organisms that depend upon each other. So, Doug, what's going to be the title of the show tonight? I think it's going to be symbiosis. Because oh, okay. that's, I guess that's uh, pretty easy. Nothing uh, clever today. It no, symbiosis, symbiosis okay. of plant pollinators, because yeah. we, we do have an <laughs> article that was written by Ginger Allen. She's from Answers in Genesis. And I, th I thought this would be a, a good subject to cover because it's a a uh, great example of uh, something that's uh, well explained by uh, a creator, God, but it isn't uh, uh, something that re evolution really explains very well. And yeah, this is kind of a, in, a, in a living organism or, line, or a relational type way, sort of like what came first, the chicken or the egg. In other words, did the plant come first and needed something to carry it, or did something was mm. wanted to carry something and found a plant? I mean, that, they, they don't really make sense unless they were mm. unless they were both come about at the same time and of course from a from the Genesis record they were really basically they were only a couple of days apart at the most between right. the one between the plants and the, and the and the insects that would have been uh, and the and the other things that would have been bringing and pollinating uh, these stuff well let's let's talk about Doug some of the different ways that this symbiosis kind of works I was looking at that article and there's a lot of different kinds of well, are. ways that this symbiosis works and we kind of are familiar with a lot of them. For the most popular one that I that I was first raised with is probably the the honeybee. You right. know what I mean? The the bee and the pollen. We know about those kinds of things, and maybe perhaps if you're a little smarter, you the butterfly as well. What are some of those? Those are kind of very interesting things. How they work, you know? You know, talk a little bit about those. You want to, or do you want to go somewhere else first? You know? Well, I did want to uh, first uh, explain one of the reasons why. I, actually chose this subject okay, because, that's fair enough, yeah. because um, I saw an article in uh, Scientific American and I was going to bring it tonight but uh, it, uh, I, I couldn't find it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we hate when that happens. But, but, you know, uh, but what, it, what it was was that it talked about uh, the reasons why humans were so uh, uh, successful on this planet and it's because uh, we cooperate with each other. Now, isn't that a little bit uh, different than what the, the survival of the fittest mentality is? Yeah, with nature, the, red in tooth and claw, all this kind of stuff where, you know, basically, they, uh, of course, we've uh, in recent years talked about more like survival of the luckiest rather than survival of the fittest necessarily. But the, but the point of it is, is that, yeah, this is a much more... Uh, Sounds much more benign. Uh, this is benign evolution, Doug? What is this? Well, apparently uh, it's evolution that uh, is uh, exploiting whatever the, uh, the theory du jour is uh, of the, uh, of the, of the week. Day, you know, huh? yeah, okay. Soup of the day. Uh -huh. uh, and it's because, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what evidence they use, whether it's co contradictory or not. Uh, They'll figure is, out some way to it, make it make it evolutionary. World, yeah, it was just you know it's kind of like a lot of these theories we come out there and, and mm. it's really if something explains really everything it can't be falsified. Mm -hmm. It's really a worldview. It's a belief system. It's a, it's a religion, if you will. But it's not a science. You may use secular or naturalistic things to try to prop up your theory, but ultimately you're, you what you believe is what you believe whether the evidence mm -hmm. contradicts it or not. Now, I mean, I, the same can be said tr is true for creation. We, we accept the scriptures as, as prima facie evidence that it's, it's the, it, and it's the word of God. So I'm not de denying that you have the right to do that. I'm just saying uh, we admit what it is. We, we, we right. use science. We believe science backs up our a priori assumptions better than, than an evolutionary one. But at least we're honest about the fact that it is a belief system. Where the, the evolutionist tries to propagandize you into thinking, no, we're science. We are objective. We are above the law. I said, mm -hmm. no, you're not. It's a world system because no matter what explanations, whatever contradictions, whatever lack of predictive success you have, you'll come up with some ad hoc, some after-the-fact explanation for why evolution is true. You just assume it to be true, and therefore, no matter what the facts are, whether they're nature, red, tooth, and claw, or symbiosis, right. you'll fit it into your worldview. This is what evolution does. It's always done this, Doug. Well, anyway, so back at it. So, um, Well, the plant pollination, pollinization is uh, something where both the species um, benefit uh, from the relationship. and. Uh, uh, and one example of that is uh, where you have uh, bumblebees uh, 
uh, pollinating flowers. Sure, the first one we talked about. The flower shape or structure uh, is what makes the benefit uh, of the, the relationship with the bumblebee and, and the flower work pretty well. And it isn't as if it's something that came about randomly. There's a, a certain kind of uh, wood flower called the bottle gentian. And it's, a, it's a something that's found as far as uh, from Manitoba to Vermont in the east, and the southwest of Virginia and Missouri, and the north, northern plain states. Flowers are a rich source of pollen uh, and nectar, and most insect pollinators are not able to get inside this, uh, this flower. Oh, really? Okay. And, and so what it is is they're, they're pollinated almost exclu exclusively by bumblebees. So the big yellow and black ones? Right, yeah. yeah. And they're the only ones that are strong enough to force the petals open and, and get inside. And oh, so like it. a honeybee or, or a regular bee like, wouldn't be able to get inside there, but the bumblebee right. is strong. <clears throat> okay, I didn't know that. I didn't realize the bumblebees actually did pop. Well, they don't yeah. produce honey, though, very, at least very much, do they? They're more, they, get, they spread the, 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 the seed of the, of the pollen of the flower to help fertilize other flowers. Isn't that, isn't that what pollen is supposed to be about? It helps, it helps to... Flowers right. propagate, right? And so you have uh, the symbiotic relationship between the bumblebee and the flower, but the question is, how did that all that relationship evolve? Uh, was it something that uh, the shape of the flower was uh, triggered by uh, successive uh, bumblebees crawling down in there, and so oh, yeah, those well. flowers got stronger and stronger, so that they uh, shut out uh, all other bugs except for this. Uh, yeah, why would they even do that? It seemed like a lot of times you'd you'd want it to be give as many different get different brands of of a bee to spread my spread mm -hmm. my pollen farther out. But it's it's done where only this particular one is at. Doug, I was noticing that when I was reading this article before, and I don't want to get ahead of, ahead of what you want to do mm -hmm. here, but it was fascinating. You talk about the, the shape of this particular flower. There's a lot of shapes and aromas and things that are like just designed. It's, I mean, you cannot avoid that. That even evolution <coughs> will use the word design. It looks because like, it doesn't appear to be designed. To me, it is right. designed. It's there's certainly like the butterfly. There's certain like little tendrils on one mm -hmm. thing. It's too. It's too fragile, or, too, or there, there's not a good place for like a bee to hold. But a butterfly who's light enough can stay, can can grasp a hold of it and get the nectar out of this particular flower. There's one over there. Mm -hmm. I was reading about that, and, and there was just a whole host of different kinds of flower or or, or plant uh, and and insect symbiotic uh, relationship that I was you know was fat. I did I had no idea there was that many different kinds. There must have been a a dozen different things that was in this article. Was, and there, there's about. another one that looks like uh, it's uh, uh, specifically designed not for bumblebees. Uh, there's uh, What's it uh, it's for? called the Turk's cap lily, and it's designed uh, for uh, butterflies because that's, uh, okay, that's uh, what uh, I was talking about. Yeah, and it allows pollination by butterflies and not bumblebees. And the light-weighted butterfly can grasp the large uh, anthers from below and obtain nectar. But uh, uh, the, that particular uh, flower... Yeah, because the antlers are little like tendrils that stick out. Yeah. And, the, and the butterfly can grasp a hold of them, but it's light enough where the bumblebee or the bees are too heavy and they, and, and they can't get in there to get the nectar. Uh, but the butterfly will get there. I, I thought that was just the coolest thing. I, I never knew that. You know, there's, yeah. no matter I, you know, all, the, all the years, Doug, we've been, we've been studying this subject, there's always new things that come up, things that maybe people have known, but, you know, somehow... It, just didn't get across my radar screen and it was fascinating just to see all those different kinds of things so and why would god create these two different uh, things uh, like this uh, it doesn't seem like uh, uh, but i think what he has had in mind is uh, uh, variety he just uh, likes to uh, make all, all kinds of different things so this and, is what i think is that you know as an artist myself doug it's a, you do you like variety and i think those who have those the creative urge and all of us i think really have creativity to some extent or mm -hmm. another we channel it in different directions of course but the fact is that Doug, we 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 absolutely want to emulate what is instinctive in us because of who made us that right is the creator himself and and you look at that you look at stuff t today variety i love variety variety is just a good thing what do they say what's the old saying variety is a spice of life mm -hmm. you know and it's neat it's like, yeah, it seems 
Doug is kind of like, why wouldn't you just want to make, if it was just evolved net, would just, you'd have the, the, the one that could have the most amount of insects, butterflies, bumblebees, whatever could come in there to pollinate, would be the most successful plant based on an evolutionary scenario. Right. But no, these are restricted to certain kinds of insects. Uh, different, and there are different kinds of plants. There are some plants, uh, Doug, I, the smell was a big factor. Yeah, you know? and like there's the carry on or foul smelling flowers. I know, which we would, yeah, what the, is it? The stinky flowers, you know. And yep. uh, uh, let me see if I can uh, read can you what find them. that one. Yeah, that, that was yeah. a fascinating one. Yes, stink flowers. It's like I, I sometimes wonder, Doug, when I'm looking at my. And they, uh, yeah. uh, they uh, entice uh, flesh eating or. Uh, uh, fecal lo loving insects, you know, oh, like dung, flies and oh, yeah, the, the flies, oh. and the, they use them to do their pollination. Yeah, and and so uh, some of these groups contains many, many of the largest and biz more bizarre flowers and blossoms on the earth, and some species may trap the polluting, uh, the uh, no, it's the pollinating insects. <laughs> polluting. <laughs> polluting insects. <laughs> some species may trap the pollinating insects. Uh, temporarily by, with movable parts in the flower to ensure the gathering and the uh, transfer of po pollen. And beetles, uh, you know, have a highly de developed sense of smell and so they like, uh, they like, like these the smelly stuff, flowers, they? Yeah, these smelly flowers. It, it, you know, I always fascinate me, my dog, is, or my brother's dog, what do dogs smell that I don't smell? I mean, <laughs> it's supposed to they have a better sense of smell, but right. they can smell and take a sniff and a lick of almost any kind of gross thing there is. And these beetles are the same. They got a higher developed sense of smell. Mm -hmm. What the heck are they smelling that I'm not? Man, I'm saying mm -hmm. there's nothing inviting about poop or garbage <laughs> or, or rotten, rotten yeah. meat, you know? And these, <laughs> these uh, you know, you know, dung fools. beetles and things like dung that. Dung beetles, I know, yeah. <laughs> now, do they pollinate dung? Does that, did I ever talk about uh, it? Yeah, the they, the, you know, they use the, and one thing about, uh, the fecal matter is especially like uh, from birds is that they'll eat seeds and then the seeds come ah. through the uh, digestive tract and uh, come out as uh, uh, poop and uh, that's how they get propagated yep yep and that's one of the reasons why uh, you know seeds are built that way you know the other thing i like is uh, the dandelion puffballs uh, that's really a uh, pretty yeah. interesting. Kids uh, love those, but adults hate them. <laughs> you like the you like the love the look of the dandelion when it's yellow, but it doesn't turn into that that puffy thing. It is kids love to go mm -hmm. and blow all the seeds everywhere, and yeah, they're very successful plant. It certainly is, and uh, your yards are full of them unless you uh, use a lot of yeah, uh, yeah, leafy yeah. The dandelion is a very useful plant. You can oh, yeah. put the, the greens in salads, apparently. They mm -hmm. obviously make dandelion wine out of it, from what I understand. It's a, apparently a very useful plant, but boy, all I've ever grown up mm -hmm. with is a weed. And, uh, or we used to do like, we used to rub it on your skin, put mm -hmm. butter on you, you know, don't you remember that? The yellow off the dandelion, or you blow the seeds all over. We used to love that. But that's the thing that this was, this article talked about, mm -hmm. you know, there are things like there are wind, and rain and things that carry seeds and things like that, but the but the symbiotic thing just seems to be screams uh, a design and a purpose. It's planned out mm -hmm. in ways where it's very specific, Doug. It's not just it's not like it's, you know we talk about irreducible complexity. It's specified right. complexity. It's specified that this creature is going to work with this particular plant or this particular uh, you know insect is going to do this kind of thing, and this one can only work with this one. It's really kind of uh, amazing and, and it just it's not haphazard at all Doug. Mm -hmm. it seems to be very well organized and orchestrated because the things live where it's what they're supposed to live it's just a very fascinating thing and that article is a fun article to read you know uh, the pawpaw is uh, okay. native to the temperate wilderness of e eastern uh, United States and there though these flowers are perfect in that they have both male and female reproductive parts but they're not self-pollinating Huh. The meat-colored petals and feet of aroma of the pawpaw attracts carrion flies, blowflies, blue bottles, green bottles, or cluster flies, and beetles, and the flies will eat nectar and plant sap along with the blood and other insects and decaying <laughs> matter. <laughs> okay. Does it smell bad? Is it yeah, it smells bad, yeah. yeah. Skunk cabbage. Oh, yeah. Uh, and dunk, uh, the dung beetles like the skunk cabbage. And uh, you know, 
uh, uh, some of the stuff you know you sort of wonder you know, about you know the fungus mushroom or older <laughs> flowers yeah uh, well you know i don't like mushrooms but a lot of people yeah. do so mushroom you think who they're, they're flowers that imitate mushroom. types of mush mushrooms uh, the, the shelf fungi that are found growing on nearby trees and that that uh, attempts to lay its eggs on what it thinks is a mushroom is guided by the flower's lip and mushroom odor to the flower stigma for pollination. What, what, so what are you saying there? In, in other words, uh, the flies uh, like to uh, they lay eggs on the mushrooms. I got that, yeah. But the, they'll also lay eggs on the uh, on these flowers uh, of the uh, of that particular plant, what was it? A, a fungus or mushroom odor flowers? Oh, so I see. The, 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 the flower smells like mushrooms. Okay, I got you. I didn't mean yeah, I didn't know mushrooms smelled. I just kind of like they were kind of bland to me. Yeah. But again, my olfactory senses are not that great. Apparently, cocoa trees. <laughs> now, this tree's blossoms are unusually located on the trunk and lowest branches. The white flowers are small and face downward. Uh, the tiny flowers attack, attract tiny flies, those known as midges. Okay. And the midges are ordinarily attracted to fungus and the cocoa flowers emit a mushroom smell. For the cocoa tree to bear fruit, first it has to be pollinated by the midges. So even the midges have a, have That's a, right. have a, have a, have a function, you know? And so the white variety of insects that we have are, all have, uh, uh, probably they have uh, some sort of pollination type of role in, in this world. Interesting. You see the jack in the pul pulpit. Oh yeah, that, that's a cool flower. And they have a fungus-like smell that attracts many tiny insects, particularly fungus gnats and thripe, <coughs> thrips. I don't know if that article talked about that. I remember Carrie used to love growing peonies. Mm -hmm. And you had to have ants crawl up on the blossom and eat the thing open so the peony, the peony would not open unless oh, the yeah. ants come up and eat or whatever they did, and that, I, I thought, wow, that is an amazing thought, you know, that, that it provides the food, or the ant, you know, why would, why would the mm -hmm. ant and the peony, that's not really about pollinization, but it's about how a, how a flower can become, stay successful, and you always watch these ants crawling up the stalk, I remember that in the spring, and they'd eat the, they'd eat the, the outer shell or whatever it was, and next thing mm -hmm. you know, you get this big blossom, and they're beautiful plants, beautiful oh, flowers, yeah. oh man, they're gorgeous, you know, Carol loved those, you know. And, and the, these uh, insects go up, uh, go into the jack in the pulpit. Okay. Uh, and they, uh, it's surrounded by, by a true tube with green or purple spathe as there's a hood on top of it. Okay. Yeah, that's what they call it as a spathe. And the, the flowers are located inside the tube at the base of the spadix. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in, okay, yeah. Insects enter through the top and drawn to the pollen at the bottom. And the male plants have a small hole at the bottom of the space for the insects to escape. Female plants do not have a bottom escape route, so an insect must find its way back to the top of the uh, plant. If the insect is trapped and dies, it's not a cause of mutual, not a case of mutualism. There's no, no, no symbiosis there. This is, well, it's yeah. kind of like you got a lot of plants. They're not into symbiosis like uh, you know, a Venus flytrap, especially, and things like that. No, these carnivorous and, and, plants. Yeah, that's these really carnivorous plants. No, you're, you're, you're not going to be uh, pollinating. We're just going to eat you. you know? Yeah. There's a, what was it? There's a, I have a jack in the pulpit. Or it wasn't jack in the pulpit. It was something where bottles, some, and they would go inside, and they couldn't get out, and they would, they, would get, they would get eaten by the plant. I can't remember the name of that plant was. No, there's also the sundew, which does uh, some of the, that type of thing, yeah. Yeah. So it's, and there's all different kinds of things out there, but, but Doug, I, I, you know, the thing about symbiosis, obviously it's not merely in insects and plants. We've talked about, right. we talked about the sharks. Remember the, the, what's the, what's the fish that cleans their teeth of the shark? The RAS, yeah, W-R-A-S-S-E. W-R-A-S-S-E, the RASA fish, or RASFIS, or whatever, okay. Yeah, and, and, and so uh, you have uh, <laughs> these cleaner fish, and the, the big old fish will line up to get their teeth cleaned by the RAS. <laughs> That's I mean, really you know, interesting, yeah. Yeah, and so there's a lot of things like that. Or, Doug, I still remember years and years ago in that book you, you wrote about that one little uh, thing where you had like a little worm-like thing and a bed of a, it was a, it was a microorganism. 
and there was an or and each one had to work with the other one to make it work. Well, I can't remember what that okay, was. Okay, uh, that was a, a microorganism that's called the Mixotrichia paradoxa. It's a, yeah, it's a huge name for this little tiny little creature, but it was a fact. And uh, where you find these things is in the, uh, the gut of Australian termites. Right, so you're, inside the, you're already inside the gut of an Australian termite. And okay. what you have is uh, uh, a big uh, bacillus. Uh, and then there's uh, all these spirochetes that uh, have their heads uh, bored into these little pimples on the, uh, on the bacillus. So spirochete, or, or is that what it's spirochete? Is that what they call it? Yeah, it's a, it's it's a, like a, a very worm, small... It's like a little worm-like thing is what right. it does, okay? And uh, then there's uh, like four flagella that come out the top, but uh, the spirochetes provide, help to pr provide locomotion, and the flagella does the steering. And so okay. this thing moves around, and there's actually a, a another bacillus that embeds its hell, head next uh, up on top it's of the bump. It's like a little bump, you know? A little, right. Yeah. What does it do? Does it do anything? Is it, do you figure out anything that it does? Uh, the idea? the bump yeah the, no the little the little, little bacillus yeah I I think there there's some sort of symbiotic uh, exchange of uh, of the fluids key to the yeah. to the little bump the little not bump but the little round I, it, it just was it's just a fascinating thing there's like this little tiny thing there's two organisms right there you know right well they're there. vastly different types of organisms yeah, they are. that they're uh, they're put together into this colony uh, and uh, part of it what it does is it helps break down the, you know, the termites eat wood and it helps digest okay. the wood. And, you know, the other thing I've you know, learned and I'm learning in this is that your, you know, the microbes that live in your gut are really beneficial for you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, studies going on now where it's promoting uh, a healthy living by uh, uh, probiotics. Oh yeah, that's big, that seems like the big uh, last five or six <coughs> years, especially, but maybe ten years. It's been really. I mean, you heard now they got something got like probiotics. But there's also something now that's got, got like a prebiotic, which I hear I'm hearing those things mm -hmm. coming around. But probiotics isn't that when like acidophilus isn't it like in yogurt and things like that? Yeah, in yogurt and yeah. in the um, you know if you get kefir, kefir is something you can get in the health food store or in. There's a special place in Kroger's where you can We're get. We're talking it. about Kiefer Sutherland, right? No, it, just thought I'd check that out. You know. Yeah, K E F I R is the way you spell it. K E. -F and it's sort of like a smoothie. Uh, okay. And uh, you, it's a yogurt smoothie, and it's it's pretty decent. But uh, uh, my wife is in, into this, and uh, she. <laughs> so you're <laughs> she really kicking so. and screaming into it, whether you like it or not. Yeah, it? she's got me discussing this stuff uh, okay. with her, and. You know, there's studies that it actually promotes things like a uh, healthy brain uh, yes. and uh, all this sort of thing. Is, uh, they're linking uh, a lot of the uh, you know, hygienic practices that we have, washing our hands and all that sort of thing, as, and the use of antibiotics. Right. Killing off bacteria if you use. Not always uh, the best thing, right? No, it isn't because uh, a lot of the good bacteria gets killed. You as know, well. I can tell you this: when I was growing up as a kid, I'm the oldest of nine kids in my family, raised in an Irish Catholic family. We were we were growing up, and our house was always dirty because we just my mom. Mm -hmm. You she she cleaned up one end of the house, and by the time you got to the end of it, we had followed up and pretty much <coughs> trashed mm -hmm. the rest of the house. It's like she'd start all over again. She could never keep up with it. But the point of it is, uh, the, the, the I want to make is that I go to these house beautifuls. It sort of was embarrassed because their houses look so nice and clean. But their kids were always sick, and we never got sick. Yeah. Which I kind of hated because I wanted to get out of school sometimes. But I mean, <laughs> we never got colds like these other mm -hmm. kids did. These clean house beautiful kids always were sick, man. And mm -hmm. we were never sick. And I sometimes wondered about that growing up. And, uh, you know, and, and Doug, I've also, you know, in recent years, <clears throat> we talked about and we'll not, they'll never do it. In a hospital, we, in, in dealing with an evolutionary scenario, you know, people are always talking about how antibiotic resistant bacteria is a superior strain or a strong, no, it's a weaker bacteria for the most part. Right. It's, it's a mechanism for absorbing nutrients has been damaged, which allows it to survive and even thrive in a sterile environment where the, the- It won't uh, absorb the antibiotic. Absorb the poisons like the other ones do. 
I said, well, the best way to do that is just kind of like let the ho- let the mm-hmm. hospital lie fallow for about a year or two, and let the let the let the regular bacteria get in there, and then take the antibiotics. So you'll kill ninety nine percent of them because they'll, yeah. they'll I'll compete the MRSA and the VRSA and all those things. But the thing of it is, Doug, is in the living world, Doug, there are so many things that are dependent on itself. We call it even though even the secular is called interdependence. And we, we and obviously they know about symbiosis. Mm-hmm. It's not only insects and plants, but it's birds and plants, birds and you know, I mean, fish and other fish. We there's so many things that you know how symbiosis Doug makes no sense based on an evolutionary scenario. It makes no sense at all. Well, it's the opposite you know? of the original theory, is what it is. Yeah, well, it is. And uh, in this article talks about yucca moss, uh, which uh, helped the. Uh, yucca plant uh, get uh, pollinated and there was one other uh, thing I saw in this uh, uh, new issue of Creation Matters. Now Creation Matters is sort of like uh, a little uh, layman's type of uh, I like it. I, I like uh, that. It's kind of neat. Type of thing yeah. of the Creation Research Society. It was talking about a, a fish called the Remora and the remora is a, uh, it's got this little uh, rubberized uh, uh, shark sucker thing. You know, it, uh, it, uh, it grabs onto, it's got a suction disc on the, on the side of it and it grabs onto a whale or a shark and it gets a free ride. Oh. And, and those things are kind of interesting in that uh, this, uh, the suction disc uh, isn't uh, present until uh, in, in the hatchlings, it's uh, actually. Now, is, this, uh, is this harmful for the organism, or is this, or is it? Di- no, is no, it doesn't harm the okay. uh, the shark, and doesn't. Uh, does it benefit the shark at all? I don't think it okay, does. Okay, so it's uh, not really. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's more it's like sort of like uh, this guy getting a free ride from yeah. uh, from the from the shark, and but it's uh, just uh, interesting why. Uh, uh, and then evolutionists would think that this is something that might have evolved. It looks, looks like it was actually created for that purpose. Yeah, it seems to me things like I say, everything's created intact and and uh, ready to go. You know, that's that's a that's a pure sign of a designer. Now, I, th- I think symbiosis is something that we can point to as being uh, a, a wonderful. Uh, evidence uh, for the the designer. That there is a plan. We'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution.